Everybody say, idolatry incognito. Exodus 20 is where we find the introduction of the Ten Commandments. We went through them last week, but just as a bit of a recap, I want to go through them again just to set the foundation of what we're talking about. Here are the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or the likeness of anything that is in heaven above in the earth or in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother, that your days will be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And thou shalt not come. I said this last week, but when we go through the Ten Commandments, we can kind of breeze through it, pass along through it, and on most days, check most of the boxes off and say, listen, we're doing pretty good. I remembered the Sabbath. I didn't kill anybody. I wanted to. You know, somebody at work was super annoying, but I took the high road and I just let it slide. I haven't made any graven images. I didn't steal anything. I'm doing good. And when we go through this list, sometimes the two easiest ones to get through are the two at the top, which is you will have no other gods before me. And you won't make any graven images unto me. But we need to understand tonight that idolatry doesn't have to do with worshiping a, a idol or a physical statue made with human hands that's out of stone or some sort of metal or some sort of wood. But idolatry goes beyond just worshiping something physical and things can become idols in our life. So last week, just as a recap, if you weren't here, and maybe if you were here, you don't remember everything that was said, that's okay. What we talked about, I told the story about uh, when I went to Louisiana, and we did street ministry, and then their guest follow-up ministry, and you had to call people, and you would ask them, where are you worshiping? And the idea was that we didn't just say, hey, man, how come you're not coming to church anymore? We just assumed that they were going somewhere else, or we made them assume that we were assuming. We knew many times they weren't going anywhere. And so we talked about this question, where are you worshiping? Look at your neighbor and say, where are you worshiping? And the question is not if we worship, but the question is where do we worship? Because we are all worshipers. And when we talk about worship, typically our immediate reaction is to talk about the physical action of worship. It's what we just did. We were standing. We were singing. We were raising our hands and praising the Lord. And that is all worship. But those things in and of themselves are not worship. I can sing. I can raise my hands. I can cry. I can kneel. I can run. I can dance. But if there is nothing behind it, if it's just a physical action, it is not worship. Worship is an action. But worship is also, anybody remember the next word? It's action and it's also, anybody? I, I got to do a better job. Worship is action, but worship is also attitude. Everybody say attitude. attitude. These two are bound together. We talked about Psalm 100 verses 1 to 5. That it says, shout, physical action, with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, that's attitude. Come before him singing with joy, that's attitude. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He has made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, that's attitude. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each and every generation. Worship is act, but worship is also attitude. And we talked about how through the Ten Commandments, when God was speaking to Moses, when he was talking about you will have no gods before me, it wasn't a hierarchy. He wasn't talking about ahead of me. It wasn't that as long as God was number one and something else was number two, that was okay. A better understanding of what the Hebrew word translated before me is, is in my presence. So when God said before me, it wasn't a hierarchy. It wasn't one, two, three. It was, you will have no other gods in my presence. So what he's saying is, hey, listen, you can't come to the tabernacle. You can't come to the altar, but then go home and worship another false god. God is not okay with that. God said, I don't want any of that around me. It's not good for you. You've got to get rid of it. You shall have no other gods in my presence. We talked about just a few idols that we as young people in our generation may struggle with. Identity, money or material things, physical appearance, entertainment, phones or technology, family, relationships, influence, popularity. These are all things that we can struggle with and things that become, 
can become idols in our lives if we're not careful. And then we talked about five clues that something may be an idol in our lives. And they were, number one, it's what I most enjoy spending time on. Number two, it is what I most love spending money on. Number three, it's what I most enjoy talking about. Number four, this is a big one. It is what I fear losing the most. And number five, the one that I would say is the most uh, powerful indicator. It causes me to disobey or to distance myself from God. If there is something in your life, I'm not talking about sin specifically, but if there is something in your life that you are pursuing, and it is causing you to disobey the word of God or distance yourself from God. Can I tell you tonight, and you might already know this, but I want to remind you, that's not a good thing. If there's something in your life that is pulling you away from obeying the word of God or living a godly life and serving the Lord, it is not good, and it very well may be an idol. And so when we talk about all of that last week and we bring it into the context of what I want to talk to you about this week, the question is this, where do we go from here? We've talked about idolatry. We've talked about what it really means being before me versus in my presence. And, and we looked at a, a few of these examples. And maybe over the last week as you've been thinking about this, I know that I've really been thinking about this word and the Bible, what it has to say about the subject of idolatry, because I really think it's something that we all struggle with and something that's really important for us to really get rooted into our spirit and question ourselves question our motives, question why we're living the way we are and how, why we're doing the things that we are. Maybe you've diagnosed yourself over the last week. I know I have. We've searched, we've evaluated our lives, we've you know, checked out the closets and made sure that there were no idols in there. Or you come to the realization or you're questioning, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about my motives and my actions and how I'm living and what I'm doing. I think that there may be something in my life that has become an idol. So, the question is, because typically we don't do it intentionally, if we love the Lord, if we are trying to serve the Lord and live a holy lifestyle, we're not going to intentionally go and grab other idols and put them in our life. Of course, we love God. We don't want to do that. But what happens is these idols, they, they sneak in and they become idols sometimes without us even realizing it. Like I said last week, sometimes good things become God things, lowercase g. Good things, healthy things, important things. We become servants to them, and they become our masters, and we become consumed by it. And so we ask ourselves, how did this thing, or how have these things become an idol unto me? I want you to examine your heart and find out where your allegiance lies and where your glory goes. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says this. It says, above all else, guard your heart. For everything that you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart. Because everything else that you do flows from your heart. Your heart defines and it determines who you are, how you think, and what you do. Because everything flows from it. Nudge your neighbor and say, everything flows from the heart. And so your heart. In my heart, they are the front line for these idols, these gods that are at war in our lives. What do we mean when we, we speak of the heart? Now, in science, we know that the heart, pretty simply, is the blood-pumping organ that makes the body run. It doesn't think. It doesn't feel. But in Hebrew culture, the heart was seen a little bit differently than how we would view it through modern medical lens today. For them... The heart wasn't just this blood-pumping organ, but the heart was a metaphor for the center or the core of a personality. It was the spiritual hub, and your life flowed from its orientation. These people, they, they knew that you could lightly touch the wrist and feel that soft beating of the heart, what we call a pulse today. And they knew that you could feel that same pulse in the neck and elsewhere. But when you place your hand over the heart, which is the center of a person, the beating was more powerful. And it stood to reason for them that everything flowed from the heart to the Hebrew. Not only blood, but personality, motives, emotions, and will. These days, we tend to neatly divide these things that make us human. There's the mind over here, there's the body over there, there's the physical part of us, and there is the intellectual part of us for some of us. Just, that was a joke. We all have intellect. Is everybody okay? Take a deep breath in, deep breath out. 
It's, it's physical and it's intellectual, but we know it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. Science has helped to see that really everything that we are and everything that we do and every part of our body is interconnected. Your physical condition affects the way you think and how you feel. Your spirit affects your physical health. And we have come to see that personality more holistically uh, during the last century. And so what we are learning through modern science and practice today really points back to what the Hebrews understood thousands of years ago. They spoke of loving God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And they understood life as a unified thing. And they spoke of that unity of the heart. In Hebrew, that word, it means the the kernel of the nut. Your heart reflects your true identity. It's who you are at the innermost part. Here's an example just to kind of explain that idea a little bit further. This is Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. It says, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. I'm going to say that again. As you can look into water, or today, you can look into a mirror and it reflects your face. So one's life, how you are living, what you are doing, how you are acting, how you are treating others, it is a reflection not of your physical appearance, but it is a reflection of your innermost being. When people are happy, they treat other people good. When people are angry or sad or upset, they don't give the same kind of treatment because there is something on the inside of them that hurts. And so the heart is the truth. It reflects our identity. Everybody say identity. And that is why the idols, these gods, lowercase g, they fight so fiercely to get every inch and every ounce of your attention, every ounce of your heart. So let's think about your heart and my heart tonight. And we'll do it by imagining this scenario. Imagine the weather's getting nice. The snow is almost all gone. It is a beautiful spring day. And you, you hear running water. You know, birds are chirping. Everything is awesome. And, and you're out for a walk. You're walking in the woods, and, and you hear running water. And so you go to investigate, and sure enough, you come to a creek. But there's something wrong with the creek. You notice that somebody has dumped trash into the creek and it's an ugly sight there's there's bottles and there's litter and garbage and plastic all of this stuff floating in the water thank god no straws though because we're using the paper ones and we're just saving the planet one starbucks drink at a time there's all this stuff floating on the water there's empty soda cans and and you can tell you can tell by looking at it that this trash in this creek that you have just found it's been sitting there for a while it's almost like a a gross film on top of the water it's not something you would want to jump in or swim in you're probably not going to catch any fish here and so because you're a good honest ethical person and you love trees and you love the environment and you love everything you don't want to just leave it the way it is you don't want to leave it the way that you found it Because it would bother your conscience to know that you went home and didn't pick up that can. Anybody pick up litter when you see it? No? If you did, it was probably mine. I'm just kidding. But you don't just leave it as you found it. There's this creek. There's garbage in it. You're confused. How did this get here? And so you say, you know what? Before I go, I'm just going to clean this up. It's only going to take me a few minutes. So you stoop down. You begin to clean up the trash. And it takes you several hours by the time you get to the end of it before you can even begin to see that you're making a difference. You, you're amazed by how much junk is there when you get below the surface. And so you sit back, you relax, and you rest for a minute, and you realize that in order to keep this site clean, you're going to have to come back each and every day. You can't do it in a day's work. And so you say, you know what, that's okay. It's something I'll be proud of. I'll come back tomorrow. I'll, I'll clean up more garbage out of this stream. Except when you come back the next day, It's as if all the work that you did the day before is gone. In fact, not only is everything that you did gone, but there is actually more garbage. There is more trash there than what you had seen the day before. Somehow it's like the garbage. It it expanded overnight. And you you think about, you look at this, and you think of the unlikelihood that somebody just came and, you know, dumped another garbage can load in in the creek. What are the chances? And so you're like, you know what, okay, so... You follow this creek upstream, and I'm making a point tonight. Hang with me just for a minute. And sure enough, as you head upstream a little bit, you come to a garbage dump that's actually been there 
for years. And it's been emptying as it's overflowed and as they've moved things around into the Passing Creek. And in your cleaning job, really, all you did was open up a spot for more garbage and more junk to just settle in and, and block the way again. And so you could go and clean it up every day. You could go and pick up the litter and the pop cans and whatever else floats in there, but really it would be like pushing a a boulder uphill because all you are going to do is actually create more and more problems, and all the work that you did is actually just going to be diminished and erased. What's the point? And so really, if you want that creek to be clean when you find it, that means you would have to go directly to the source and deal with what is at the top. And so think of your heart, just as the Hebrews did, as the source from which your life flows, your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. And think about this. How much of our life do we spend dealing with visible garbage, cleaning some things up, picking some things up, putting some things back in order? It's easy. It makes us feel good. We can look at the work that we've done and say, you know what, I've made improvements. This is good. This is nice. I like it. We spend all of this time cleaning up the visible garbage, what's right in front of us, rather than heading upstream, so to speak, and and dealing with the source that is producing it. We all are guilty, whether we realize it or not. We spend great amounts of time, money, energy, and frustration doing trash removal in our life when something upstream is still dumping into the flow. Oftentimes, we can focus on what we can call tonight as as downstream activities. We can clean up the garbage when we really know the truth is that the thing that is creating this mess and the thing that is creating this problem is upstream. This is flowing from somewhere, and we need to get with the source. Or we need to get to the source. I apologize. We have this tendency to focus on what's downstream because it's easier. We can clean it up quickly. It's so much easier to pick up a little bit of trash, so to speak. And dealing with what's upstream is a commitment. It's hard work. But the gods that are in the world, the idols that are begging for our attention and begging for our heart, they they know that the heart is the battlefield from where everything else flows. It's where the war is won. And overlooking the heart and focusing just on what's downstream could just be uh, described as behavior modification. We're just going to change this. I'm going to tweak that. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to get up a little bit earlier. I'm going to work out every second day. Whatever it is, it's a behavior that you are changing, but really you're actually just doing this quick fix and and masking. You are covering up and putting a band-aid over something that doesn't just need to stop bleeding. It needs surgery. There is something in your life where these things are flowing from, and so often we sweep it under the rug or do the quick fix because we don't want to deal with what is at the source. It all comes down to what is happening in our hearts. And that is why Jesus put so much emphasis there. That is why Jesus talked about the heart, and that is why God is so focused, and that is why it made its way into the Ten Commandments, and it was commandment number one, that you will have no other gods before me, because when other things become idols, when other things become gods to us, it is going to change our heart, and there is going to be things that flow from that source that are not good. They are not beneficial. They are not things that we need in our life. Jesus, he wasn't quick to reward good behavior that he saw in people if their heart wasn't right. If people were doing good things but their motives were bad, if they were doing good things but they had a bad spirit, Jesus didn't talk good about those people. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus, he was talking about the religious leaders of that day. And what he said about them is he said, these people... These religious people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're saying good things. They're saying they love me. They're they're saying they want to serve me, and they do this, and they do that, and they worship, and they pray, and they're they're having this verbal uh, thing that comes out and says, I love God. But really, on the inside, the source where everything flows from, their heart was far from him. Later in the chapter, Jesus says, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? 
But the things that come out of a person's mouth, they come from the heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. That's Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 and 19. Often, we can emphasize and we can focus on the outside. But Jesus, he's making this point that, you know what? The outside is good and the outside is important. And you shouldn't talk like that and you shouldn't go there and you shouldn't dress like that and you shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. There are things on the outside that matter. But Jesus was making the point that, listen, if you fix the inside first, the outside will fix itself. You can maybe have a problem with swearing and say, you know, I don't want to swear anymore. But if you don't fix what's on the inside, that's going to be a problem. If you're walking around angry or, or mad and, and struggling with hatred or whatever it is because something's happened to you in your life, if you're going to just say, you know, I'm just going to try my best. I'm going to modify my behavior and not act like that, but not deal with the root, not deal with the source from which those things flow, you are only fooling yourself. We want to focus on what's on the outside. But Jesus, he makes the point that it is all about what's on the inside. The heart is the battleground for the gods because everything flows from it. Look at your neighbor and say, your heart's important. Your heart is important. Everything we do flows from the heart. Psalm chapter 139, verse 23 in the New Living, it says this, the psalm writer, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Search me, O God, and know my heart. There are many words that we can attribute to God. But when we talk about idolatry, when we talk about other things that are pulling for our time and our attention and our energy, there is one specific word that I want to talk to us tonight about God. And it's not one that we use often. But our God is a jealous God. Anybody ever been jealous before? Got some people. Jealousy is a weird thing. Because sometimes you don't even know it's there until you're jealous, right? Does that make sense? It's like you didn't think you'd be jealous, but then something happens. You're like, you know what? I actually am really jealous, and I didn't think I would be. God is jealous. He's jealous. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 to 5. Again, talking about these first two commandments. It said, you must not make yourself an idol of any kind or, or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Please understand that this word, jealous or jealousy, it's not a word that we ascribe to God. It's not a word that because we understand the context and, and who he is to the best of our ability through the scripture that we say, oh yeah, God is obviously jealous. That is the case, but, but the root of it, where we get this word from, is actually from God himself. God was the one to say, I am jealous. I will not tolerate. I will not accept you bowing down or worshiping other gods. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, to expand on this, it says, the Lord your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God. God is jealous for your heart. Not because God is petty. Not because God is insecure. But God is jealous for your heart because he loves you. The reason that God has such a problem with idolatry is that his love for you is all-consuming, and he loves you too much to share you with anybody else. God doesn't have a complex. He doesn't have a problem. He's just jealous because he loves you, and he doesn't want to share you with anything else, let alone something else that is going to harm you and hurt you and just bring you trouble in life. And so as we go through tonight's lesson and, and talk about this for the next few weeks, you will realize at some point, you will have the epiphany or something will come to your mind and you will realize that the idols 
You will realize the idols that are at war in your life. And God will speak. And God will challenge you because he's given us free will. And he'll challenge you with these two words. You choose. It's your choice whether you serve the Lord or serve something else. And so God says, you know what? I'm jealous, and I don't want you to do it, and I know it's not going to be good for you, but you can choose. You can choose between me and money. You can choose between me and your career. You can choose between God and that relationship. You can choose between God and that family member. You can choose between God and popularity. You can choose between God and influence or monetary possessions. Whatever it is, you choose. God will not force it on you. He leaves the option up to you. If you keep watch over your your own heart, you'll face those moments, those fork in the road moments where you've got to make a decision. Okay, am I going to live for God or am I just going to pursue my own pursue my own will and my own agenda? There is no room for anyone or anything but God. That is how much God loves you. We can come back to the music tonight. I'll just be a few more minutes. We can't understand the seriousness of idolatry. We can't understand how important this is to God without understanding the jealousy of God. And you can't understand His jealousy without understanding His relentless, powerful love for you because those two things are intertwined. If somebody ever asks you, what is so special? What is so different about Christianity? What sets it apart from other world religions like Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or or anything else? What is it that's different about Christianity? What is it different? What is so different about your God that you serve in the Bible and the Word and who is Jesus? What is different about it? Your answer is this. There is no other religion. There is Nowhere else that you can turn to where you find God in pursuit of people. There are many other religions. There are many other gods that people worship. There are many idols that people even today bow down to. But can I tell you that those gods and those idols, all they want in worship is worship. But our God, He desires that too. But our God is chasing after us. God loves us so much that He doesn't want to share our time or attention with anything else. They're intertwined. Nowhere else do you find a God. No other religion do you find a God that is chasing after His people. There's a book that was written by Charles Dickens. It's called David Copperfield. And it tells the story of a family that lives by the sea in an old abandoned boat. The father figure, he's an aging, long-retired fisherman. He, he has an adopted nephew and niece that live with him. The niece's name is Emily, and he, he dotes on her. And his greatest aspiration for Emily, for his adopted niece, is to see her married and happy with a fine young man. But Emily has other ideas. She is taken away by a fast-talking, handsome man who promises to marry her and show her the great sights of the world. But she has to run away with him that night. No time to think. No time to linger. If this is the life you want, you've got to leave now. And Emily does. But it soon soon becomes clear to her that this man has no intention of marrying her. And since this is the mid-1800s when the story is written, her name is ruined, and the name of her humble family is also ruined because of her actions. And it was understood in such situations that someone who messes up on this scale shouldn't even think about going home. So instead, a young lady like Emily, who has run away with the man, thinking that they were going to elope and get married, now is facing shame and rejection and hurt and heartache and everything that was promised in a moment is now taken away. And so she has no other option. Emily can't go home. She has no other choice but to turn to prostitution. And that's what Emily does. 
and her grief-stricken uncle, he, he understands all this as it plays out, but it makes no difference to him. And so he takes every penny to his name and, and he leaves and he searches the entire world for his niece. And he promises that if it takes him the rest of his life, so be it. He will visit every dark, seedy street corner in every town in Europe until he finds her because his love for her is completely unaffected by what she has done. He simply can't stand the idea of losing, losing her. So he searches for many years until all of his hairs are gray. And finally, he finds Emily and he brings her home. And, and she can't believe that he had come searching for her. She can't believe that anyone would care about her, but he is happier than he has ever been because his child has come home. Jesus told a similar story. This time, it's about a prodigal son who left and whose father ran out to meet him when he returned. Can I tell you tonight that that is our God? Our God is jealous. Our God is insistent. And he is a loving God. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were yet sinners, God kept on chasing. God kept on moving. God kept on pursuing each and every one of us. And he still does today. No matter where you are in your walk with God, no matter how long you've been coming to church, if this is your first time or your 10th year coming to church, can I tell you that God is chasing after you. God loves you and God is jealous for you. And God does not want to see you bound by idolatry and gods that are just weighing you down. He chases us down. He keeps coming after us. He hates everything that becomes an obstacle between him and and us. Everything that blocks our view of him or, or threatens to keep us from hearing his voice. God wants us and he doesn't want just some of us. God wants all of us. Can I tell you tonight that God knows what's best for you. God knows what's best for you more than you do. God knows what's best for you more than I do or than your pastors do. God knows what's best. God is jealous for your whole heart. And so my question tonight as I close is, are you wholeheartedly serving God? Are you wholeheartedly living a life that is pleasing and acceptable, acceptable to Him? And are you living your life that at the end of it, when you get to heaven, you are going to hear those words, well done. And so when we talk about idolatry, it all starts in the heart. That's where it begins, and, and everything else begins to flow from it. And it's not that God just wants all of our attention because he's egocentric. God is jealous. And you need to grasp that concept that God is jealous because he loves you so much. He knows those things are not good for you. So he's saying, you can't have anything else before me because they're going to hurt you. They're going to weigh you down. They're going to pull you down. I'm jealous for you. I'm pursuing you. And so if there's any idols, if there's any gods, if there's anything else that you're serving, you need to get it out of your heart. Are you wholeheartedly serving God? Can you stand with me tonight? thank you for your attention tonight, but before we go, I want to pray for us. And I want to pray that the psalmist prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God, know my heart. Can we pray together right now? Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit that I feel in this room right now. God, I know that your word God, I know that your Holy Spirit is challenging us. God, I know that it is convicting us and it is bringing us higher tonight. So God, I pray for each and every one of us in this room. Would you pray a prayer like this with me tonight in your own words? God, I, would you search my heart tonight? God, search me. And God, if there is anything in my life that is not pleasing, if there is anything in my life that I have put above you, God, I pray that you would show it to me tonight because, God, I don't want to live a life bound by idols and other gods. God, I want to live a life wholeheartedly for you. And, God, I pray that you would give us a fresh revelation. 
God, I pray that you would give us a fresh understanding of your jealousy and your love for us. God, I pray that we would understand that even on our worst days and even on the days that we turned our backs on you or the seasons of life where we ran from your presence, God, you are different than other gods because when we were running from you, God, you were still running after us. You were relentlessly pursuing us because you loved us that much. God, give us a revelation of that love. And I pray that as we grab the revelation of that love, that we would grab a revelation of that jealousy, that you don't want to share our time and energy and attention with anything else or anybody else. You are jealous, God. And so God, tonight, and as we leave this place, as we close this service, God, we just pray. God, search our heart. And we are going to do some soul searching on our own and just go through our lives. And God, we want to understand if there is anything in our life that has become an idol. And if there is, Lord, bring it to the surface. Bring it to our minds. God, I pray that it would be a revelation, an epiphany, that it would come to our minds tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that we have felt in this place all night. I pray that as we close this service, God, you would go with us. God, I pray that over the next few days that we have school, that you would create opportunity. God, I pray that you would open doors and create connections so that we can minister to someone else in their time of need so that we can share the gospel and the goodness of who you are with somebody else. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being a Capital Community Youth tonight. It looks like main service ended uh, already. So God bless you, and we will see you this weekend. Please keep in uh, remembrance of those youth events that are happening next weekend. High five somebody on your way out. Tell them that you love them. You are so glad to see them. We'll see you this weekend.